Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Hi. The Great Antidote is on a break from recording new episodes currently. In the meantime, we've handpicked these episodes for you, so sit back and relax, hop on your bike, or get out your notepad, however you enjoy your podcast. We'll catch you soon for new episodes. Hi, welcome back to my podcast. It is my great pleasure to welcome Scott Bullock today. He is the president and general counsel of the Institute for Justice, which pursues strategic public interest litigation that combines courtroom advocacy with media relations, activism, and strategic research to secure constitutional protection for individual rights, which is so cool. So welcome, Scott. Great to be with you, Julia. Today, I would like for us to talk about one aspect of criminal justice reform that few people know about and few people even like have heard of, which is civil asset forfeiture, um, which sounds really confusing. But once you once you know what it is, it won't be as confusing. So before we start, I want to ask you one question that I ask all my guests, which is what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? I think one of the hardest things uh, for young people to have, and, and not just of your generation, but I think this is true for every generation, is uh, perspective. To really take a long view of history and how the world is is unfolding, and you know, even with all the challenges to liberty today, and and there are there are several uh, to be sure. Uh, there are many things that have gotten better. Uh, even in my lifetime, and certainly in the last 50 years on multiple fronts. You know, 50 years ago, people of your generation, or at least the, the, the young men of your generation, were worried about being forcibly removed from their homes and their farms and sent uh, to a jungle halfway around the world to fight in a war that they didn't really believe in. Uh, 30 years ago, when I was their age, I was atomic uh, war was a and atomic destruction and exchanges was a real possibility. There was a um, a, a a disease that was running uh, rampant. It was scaring a bunch of people throughout the country called uh, AIDS. And violent crime was you know off the uh, uh, was a challenge in many many areas. And now you see a lot of those things not be nearly the problems that they once were. The draft no longer exists, thanks in large part to the great libertarian economist Milton Friedman. Um, the threat of nuclear exchange has gone down considerably. AIDS is a chronic condition that, that, that people live with. And even a lot of the things that issues that we've worked on in the near 30 years that IJ's been, um, that's been around, uh, like occupational licensing and eminent domain abuse, and even something as outrageous as civil forfeiture that we're going to talk about, uh, we've made significant progress in those areas through a long and carefully crafted and concerted campaigns to try to change the law in the world in, in those areas. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, but progress has been has been made. And then I also think that as part of like getting perspective on things too, is that you know. People your age especially might look around and say it seems like everybody's you know, either a socialist or kind of a rabid Trump supporter. Uh, but the good news is that there are so many more people that are involved in the fight for liberty, and especially a lot of young people, than there once was, even when I was growing up, and certainly 50 years ago or more. And you're better connected. Uh, you're fighting this on multiple fronts. And there's just more of you. There's more women. Which is which is great to see. I think the liberty movement has to do a better job in outreach to the minorities and other ethnic uh, groups. But we can provide a perspective that's different from the left and the right, and that I think it's a message that a lot of younger people and people that have seen kind of the failures of both sides of the political spectrum will be very open to. So that's one thing that I that I, I find encouraging and something I always like to remind younger people. <laughs> 
good response. I always like to hear. It's kind of a, um, I don't know. It's like nice. It helps me relax in like yeah. facing the problems of the world today. That's right. Um, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed and, and it's, and you, you got to take that kind of longer perspective and, and look at um, you know, what's been achieved so far. And then that can give you hope and, and, and kind of knowledge for, you know, fighting the battles that are coming down, coming down the pike. First, can you tell us what the Institute for Justice is and what you guys do? Who, who do you, like, who's your, who are your clients? And if I were to get into some trouble with the law or something, what would happen, what would have to happen for you to take my case? Yeah. And so the, the uh, Institute for Justice is the National Law Firm for Liberty. And we litigate uh, in defense of essential constitutional freedoms. Our four primary areas of focus are economic liberty, private property rights, educational choice, uh, and free speech rights. But we take on a whole range of other topics, uh, too, including our recent project on immunity and accountability, which is an issue that's really risen to the public um, consciousness, and especially in the past several months with the killing of George Floyd. So um, we are a public interest law shop, so we represent real people, uh, and we sue the government, uh, federal, state, and local, to vindicate essential constitutional rights. Uh, and we do this um, in a way that tries to not only protect the rights of our clients, but to set a precedent that can apply as broadly as possible. So we're not just representing kind of anybody that walks into the door that needs help, even though you know, there's a lot of people that, that, that do need help. We're carefully selecting our cases and our clients to make sure that they are positioned just right to get that precedent and to really raise this issue to, um, to the national dialogue uh, about this. And because we're not just litigating the court of law, we're using all the tools of public interest law at our disposal, which includes major uh, public communications and media efforts, grassroots activism, strategic research, and then some legislative efforts uh, then too, once there's enough interest in these issues. And even politicians might come around and start uh, taking notice of them. <laughs> I honestly, what you guys do is just amazing. I just, it's like mind blowing. We'll get into some of that. Um, but for now, let's talk about civil asset forfeiture. People recently, as you mentioned, have been protesting in the street about the death of George Floyd, which has been a tragic event. And luckily, out of all of like the awful stuff, it's opened the eyes of many people about some police practices and the incentives in the police force that only experts in that field used to really talk about. And I recently talked to Clark Neely at Cato about police unions, qualified immunity, and prosecutors and how that played a role in the death of George Floyd and many others in bad circumstances around police and similar things. We didn't talk about other bad incentives that plague the system, such as civil asset forfeiture, which IJ and you have been fighting for several years. So what is civil asset forfeiture and how does it fit in with recent events? Yeah, well, civil forfeiture is just one of these powers of government that most people can't believe exists. Uh, and when you tell them about it, they say, oh, come on, you're, you're, th there's, there must be something you're not telling me about it. How can this power exist in a country that's supposed to respect property rights and rights to due process? Uh, but the sad reality is, is that it does exist. And it goes to some of the very things you were talking about, which is the perverse incentives that exist in the law and how law enforcement powers have grown so much over the past uh, several decades. So civil forfeiture is the power of government to take your home, your car, your cash, your business, regardless of whether you've been convicted or even charged with a crime. And so it's very different than what some people might think of as a forfeiture, which is criminal forfeiture. Criminal forfeiture is tied to the conviction of a person. And even though that power in some instances can be abused, it at least in theory makes sense. 
you don't want people profiting from illegal activity. The classic example of that is somebody like Bernie Madoff, who bilked his investors out of millions of dollars and, of course, used those funds to buy a great condominium and have homes throughout the world and yachts and things like that. Obviously, if you're found guilty or you plead guilty to those offenses, you want to be able to uh, take that property from them because they, it was ill-gotten gain. That's not true with civil forfeiture. Civil forfeiture is not tied to the uh, to the criminal conviction of an individual, and the history of it is 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 really interesting because it's something that shows how um, government power just grows over time. And if it's not limited by the Constitution, for instance, it just keeps growing unchecked. And has a real impact upon people's uh, liberties. So it was a power originally in um, in the U.S. and it has kind of a medieval origin to it. But it arose in the U.S. La- largely admiralty laws, and it was used in maritime situations when uh, the government, if they wanted to, uh, for instance, try to get excise taxes paid on goods that were being imported into the U.S. And at one time, before the federal income tax, that was the major way that the federal government uh, gained its uh, gained its revenue. Uh, but it was very difficult to get p- what was called personal jurisdiction over what might be the offender, because they could be on the high seas, they could be in another country. So the um, courts recognized a power to go against a piece of property. So if the tax, for instance, wasn't paid on the goods and they couldn't find the person because they were they were outside of your jurisdiction, there was a limited remedy that was um, used to go after what's called in the law, the thing itself. Uh, and so that was largely the way it was used for uh, many, many uh, uh, years, decades uh, even. But it started to change in, not surprisingly, Uh, when the government started uh, going after victimless crimes. So it was used during Prohibition. It was uh, then used at the start of the drug war in the uh, the 1980s. And what's kind of bizarre about this, stemming from its its older origins, that the actions are not against a person or a property owner. They are against the thing itself. So you have... Uh, cases like a case I litigated in, uh, and IJ litigated in Texas called State of Texas versus one 2004 Chevrolet Silverado, or a case we litigated in uh, Massachusetts where it represented a motel owner whose uh, property was being sought by the federal government. It was um, United States of America versus uh, 434 Main Street, Tewksbury, Massachusetts. Or you have Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus $5,600 in U.S. currency. So it's this kind of crazy idea that the property itself is somehow elite, uh, has convicted, been um, con- uh, uh, accused of a crime, and the action is against the property. And then the property owner has to basically intervene in the case. He's actually called an intervener in the case to try to claim that this is my property and I have a right to hold on to it. Uh, and so it's this it's this system that is kind of astonishing and it's almost laughable. And you can the, the case names are crazy. One of my favorites is United States of America versus one solid gold object in the form of a rooster. Uh, an actual uh, forfeiture case uh, that was that, that's been uh, that was on the books uh, with it, but what's really changed and what really caused civil forfeiture to skyrocket was in 1984, Congress passed a um, passed a law that changed civil forfeiture. Not only expanded the power of civil forfeiture, but it also changed the incentives that were in place. So that uh, beforehand, if the government took property through forfeiture, it went to the general revenue account of the government. But when these changes were made in the 1980s, the funds went right back to the very people who were prosecuting the forfeiture actions, the police and prosecutors, thereby giving them a direct and perverse incentive 
to take as much property as possible. And as I'm sure you've had to had many people on your podcast tell you know, a lot of economists that incentives matter. And if you give people the wrong incentives and perverse incentives, they're going to act accordingly. And so what was once a kind of a backwater of the law for a number of years, it wasn't uh, very lucrative. Once that change was put into the law, civil forfeiture took off and the revenue from it has skyrocketed. And it's now a billion uh, dollar a year, a multiple billion dollar a year industry at the federal and state levels. So as I was telling you before the interview, there's this John Oliver segment, which actually there's a clip of you in it, which when I was watching it again, I was like, oh, oh. And um, he talks about, well, first he gives a ton of examples and like they're similar to the ones you gave. They're all like ridiculously funny. You would not think that it's an actual thing, but it is. Um, He also talks about how the people, when they go to try to get their stuff back, like this couple had their house taken away because their son was found with heroin or something like that. Something crazy that doesn't seem connected at all. Um, They went to court to try to get it back, but it was not a judge. It was a police officer or like someone in the DA's office that was prosecuted, right? Yeah. Who was like, no, you can't have it back. And there was no judge or anything, which seems ridiculous. That just seems to skew the incentives even more. Exactly. And and we didn't even get to the, I didn't even get to the part of, of how these procedures actually take place. And, and that was actually an IJ case, um, from Philadelphia that had, uh, what was really a forfeiture machine that was depriving thousands of people of their property, including their homes in this really egregious uh, way. It was disproportionately affecting, of course, the poor and minorities that didn't have the wherewithal to fight back against uh, civil forfeiture. And we exposed that, fought against it, and they're uh, now in the process of dismantling it uh, uh, as well. And that was an instance which was even kind of the worst of the worst, because you're right, when the people tried to go to court to even fight the civil forfeiture, they uh, this system in Philadelphia didn't even have a judge present. You had to negotiate with the prosecutors who had the direct financial incentive to try to take your property because they would financially gain uh, uh, from it. So it was it was one of the most outrageous examples of, of civil forfeiture. But but they're legion. And the John Oliver piece, you're right, is, it was just this wonderful way of capturing. We had worked with him, provided the show with a lot of uh, material. They used a segment that I had done um, – Uh, about a Washington Post expose that showed uh, how much currency is taken on our nation's highways, which is just another way that uh, police and prosecutors look to um, pad their budgets and and, and increase their bottom lines. But another part of civil forfeiture, in addition to the ridiculous case names and the fact that it's a civil uh, proceeding and the fact that the police and prosecutors get to keep all uh, all the property that they forfeit, for their own use, uh, is that under civil forfeiture laws, it is a civil proceeding. So the usual procedures that are in place to protect criminal defendants are thrown out the window. And it's just a matter of a civil suit in the way that you know you might sue your neighbor over um, the, a property line or two other parties might engage in civil litigation. So um, under civil forfeiture, Uh, The burden is not on the government to prove your guilt. The burden is on you to prove your innocence. And uh, that is, of course, exactly the opposite of the criminal standard that just about everybody knows of, is that the government has to prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That is not true in civil forfeiture proceedings. And the standards is not uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. It's by a preponderance of the evidence of uh, basically over 50 uh, percent. If you're poor, uh, you do not have the right to an attorney the way you would in a criminal proceeding because the action is against the property. And so it puts property owners at a horrible disadvantage uh, when they fight the government because oftentimes the costs of fighting the forfeiture action 
will quickly exceed the value of the property itself, especially if the government's taking your car away from you or maybe $6,000 in cash. If you go out and hire a lawyer, which you're responsible for doing, uh, lawyers cost quite a bit of money unless you get the Institute for Justice to represent you for free. Uh, But we can only take on a handful of these cases. So the government knows that. Oftentimes in these instances, the government wins by default because, again, because it's a civil proceeding, if you don't choose to um, try to defend uh, yourself and to get, try to get your property back, the government can just automatically uh, forfeit the property. Uh, or the government will oftentimes settle with you. Most civil cases you probably know in the country are settled. And because both sides don't want to spend the money that it would cost to actually get to a trial, and so the government uses that to its advantage and says, okay, you know, maybe we took this $7,000 from you. How about we settle this? And, you know, we'll, we'll see where you're coming from, so we'll give you back $3,500. And they think they're being really magnanimous and this is a great thing. Meanwhile, you didn't do anything wrong and you're out half of your currency. But most people choose to take that route because they can't afford what it would take to try to fight a state government, a local prosecutor, in some instances, the federal government itself. That sounds absolutely awful. Um, A few years ago, the New York Times had a piece about seminars that were offered to police officers to help them increase their effectiveness at using civil asset forfeiture. And I'm reading from the article here, it says, quote, don't bother with jewelry, too hard to dispose of, and computers, everybody's already ha- everybody's got one already. Do go after flat screen TVs, cash, and cars, especially nice cars, end quote. And in those seminars, you learn how to seize things from innocent owners, which sounds horrifying. And if, if it doesn't, like, if you're taking stuff from innocent people, then, and it's really against the property and not the person, does it help catch criminals at all or anything? Not at all. And and studies have, have repeatedly shown that this does not have anything to do with um, uh, with getting the bad guys. It doesn't have any impact upon, uh, upon crime rates. Uh, this really is about getting revenue and, uh, and looking for opportunities to uh, increase the budgets of law enforcement agencies. And it's to the detriment of solving actual crimes, too. And because it takes your focus away from things that you know might not really benefit you or your department, like, for instance, cracking open an old cold case file, what are the chances of that being solved? And that's a really uphill battle and nothing will probably come of it. Um, would you rather choose that or really focus on getting the pat on the back for bringing in the cash or the property that will then benefit your department through better equipment or being able to be used for overtime pay or to go to uh, conventions that prosecutors and law enforcement agents occasionally go to? So it really warps the perspective of law enforcement, and it turns them into what you know, the New York Times and many other places have um, exposed, which is they're f- thinking about and figuring out ways to try to take as much property from people as possible. And that's incredibly corrupting for law enforcement itself. And it really shows to the public that th- this is not... They, they're not trusting law enforcement as, as much because, see, like, well, are they really here to protect me or are they just out to try to line their pockets? So it really leads to a diminishment between kind of community and police relations. And was yet another example that people can show to saying what's happening to law enforcement, that, that they're going down uh, this path. And what's been interesting to see, too, in, in the defense of civil forfeiture is that uh, initially, when we first got involved in this about 10 years ago, they would law enforcement would oftentimes make the argument, oh, no, this is really about depriving the fruits of, of, the, of the criminal conduct of the bad guys, taking away their property. And that's the perspective that, that we have. And that's what our focus really is on it. And that wasn't true at the time. But it's really shifted as we've been able to 
win these cases and expose civil forfeiture in, in, in many different forums. And people are becoming more aware of it through like the John Oliver piece and, and many others. And so legislators and um, have been taking an interest in this. And you've seen their defense change from, oh, this is just getting the, you know, getting the bad guys and, 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 and getting their property to, yep, this is about uh, getting, getting money for our agencies. And if, if we don't have this ability to take property through civil forfeiture, we are going to ask you to raise people's taxes for this. And so they've really changed their perspective to show that this really is about trying to get revenue. And what's another perverse thing about this is that you have executive branch officials, police and prosecutors, basically raising revenue from the citizenry. And that is a blatant violation of the clear separation of powers that we have under the Constitution, because executive branch officials are supposed to enforce the law. They are out executing the law that has been set by the legislature. And one of the legislature's main tasks is determining the rate of taxes and revenue that will be gained and, and taken from the citizens. And that is then there's political accountability for it. And you know, there's challenges with that, but that's the idea behind it. And there's, you know, there's, there's a reason for legislative bodies uh, making those determinations. Here you have executive branch officials that are out supposedly not only enforcing the law, but basically raising their own revenue um, and, and creating basically a slush fund for executive branch officials to be used at their discretion. So it's really dangerous. One of the reforms that we've always advocated short of abolishing civil forfeiture entirely, which is what we think should be done, is that if you're going to have civil forfeiture, really any type of forfeiture, the money should go back to the general pot, the general revenue fund of the government at whatever level of government it is, and then elected officials uh, get to decide how that money is spent. It is extremely dangerous to give these um, incentives to the very people whose job it is, is to fairly uh, administer justice for everybody. Is there any sort of racial aspect to this issue? Like, does it impact different groups in different ways at all? Well, certainly it, it impacts the, the poor and, and minority groups most um, directly and most significantly because those are the people that have the fewest resources to fight back against these, against these forfeitures. And a lot of the forfeitures are not big money ones. I mean, every once in a while, there'll be a, you know, a, a forfeiture of a big drug lord's uh, property. But usually that's tied to the prosecution of the drug lord and that you could you know, then take his property through, through criminal forfeiture. Oftentimes, these forfeitures are a few thousand dollars, a car, um, uh, a, an older home that you saw, especially in Philadelphia, where it, it was really impacting neighborhoods in Philadelphia that were the uh, that were the poorest neighborhoods uh, in the city. So uh, that's where you really uh, see its impact. And those are the people that are least able to afford an attorney to try to fight back uh, against this. What are the solutions? I mean, I know you already mentioned straight up, like just getting rid of it, but also just returning the money to the general government instead of directly to the people that took the money. But what sorts of things first should be done legisl like on the legislative level, but also what can people do? Like people like me, like at home. Yeah. So I, I think it's a really important question. And I do think that overall civil forfeiture should be abolished. Uh, it, you know, it should not exist in, in a country that is supposed to uh, respect these essential constitutional uh, liberties. Um, that, that doesn't mean the government is without power because criminal forfeiture laws um, can be legitimate and you could still take the ill-gotten gains uh, from uh, people who have violated the law. But then you're actually in a court of law. The, the accused is, is, is proven guilty or pleads guilty to, uh, to the crime, and then it is tied to that criminal conviction. So you should not be in a situation where the government can take your property 
um, without convicting or in some in many instances even charging you with a crime. Short of that, there's several things that can be done to try to change the law. The, um, the burden of proof should be raised at least up to a standard that's called clear and convincing and the, rather than just this preponderance of evidence standard that exists currently under the law, uh, if in, in a criminal pr- proceeding, of course, you have guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And if property is taken, the burden should be on the government to show that the property owner um, is, is somehow involved in illegal activity rather than the property owner trying to prove his innocence, which is what is the law in over 40 states and at the federal level. So it's this burden shifting that can make a real, make a real difference. And as I said, I think the most fundamental reform that can take place short of outright um, ending civil forfeiture entirely is to just change this incentive structure that's, that's in place to allow the, the money to go to the general fund, not back to the very people who are who are uh, prosecuting these offenses and to the police officers on the street that are looking and deciding whether or not to seize uh, to seize the property. And I think individuals can obviously speak out about these abuses. This is something that is a great issue to unite people across the political spectrum because this is an issue that people really can't believe it, it exists. It's something that most people um, think is wrong. It was one of the few th- uh, issues that was actually in both uh, re- calls to reform civil forfeiture that was both in the Republican and Democratic uh, platforms for the last convention. Um, and so, and it's one that has garnered uh, significant bipartisan support uh, in, in legislatures that have, that have looked at it. So it's a great issue that out of as I said, really kind of unites people regardless of their ideology because they just think it's they just think it's fundamentally wrong. And then knowing about your rights too, and um, and being able to fight back against civil forfeiture is something that we've um, really spent a lot of time working on too to educate people about this, get the word out about it, and provide resources to people if their property is taken. Here's what you can do. We've even done things like work on our search engine optimization to make sure that um, if you face a forfeiture action, the Institute for Justice's name is going to appear and you're going to be able to find very practical advice. We actually have a person whose full-time job it is at IJ is to um, look at these cases to see what we might be able to do to help people that are the victims of civil forfeiture. And if we aren't able to do it, if it's not a case that lends itself to public interest uh, litigation, uh, we oftentimes will refer the case out to people, at least give them some general guidance as to how they might be able to fight this and, and hopefully in certain instances set them up with lawyers who are willing to, to help out on this. So really quickly, I want to talk about something else that I at least see as a uniting force again, like through the political spectrum, which is another property rights issue, which is eminent domain, which you took the case, um, you took this historic case to the Supreme Court, and it's called Kilo versus the City of New London, which is a very widely discussed case. Um, can you give us like a 30-second overview about what the case was about? Sure. Yeah, that was a case, uh, an issue that I litigated for a number of years at, at, at IJ. Um, and my uh, now so senior vice president of IJ, Dana Berliner, and I did cases throughout the country and fighting back against this idea that happened in New London, which uh, that eminent domain can be used uh, beyond its authorized use in the Constitution for a public use, uh, but in New London and many other places, is it, it was being used for private economic development purposes. And this is a, clearly a violation of the uh, guarantees in the Constitution. And again, getting back to the perverse incentives factor of it, the courts allowed government to do more of this to stretch the definition of public use. And then they started using eminent domain to take property from one private owner to hand it over to another private owner in the name of economic development. And that was the issue that got up before the uh, before the Supreme Court in Kilo. Uh, 
I watched the movie recently about the case, and it's called Little Pink House. It's a great movie. I thought it was very educational and very real. Like, I easily could connect to that, and it just made the entire thing just, it just, I don't know. It was very well done, um, and it just outraged me. And so even while you lost the case, after the whole thing was over, everyone at IJ kept working to fight against eminent domain abuse. So what have what legislative changes have happened since that case? Yeah, it, it's, it's exactly what happened in the wake of it. We took what was a setback in court and turned it into really significant change throughout uh, the country. It's a classic example of losing the battle but winning the war. And it's one of the main reasons why, as we talked about early in our, in, earlier in our conversation, that we don't just litigate cases in court. We do all of this larger campaign to raise public awareness of this. Um, to the point, like what happened in Kilo, was we really uh, educated the public about this. It was in many, many news discussions. It was on 60 Minutes, which is, you know, broadcast, of course, that people still watch. But it, even at that time, about 15 years ago, was one of the most highly rated shows in the country. There was an expose on that a year before um, uh, Kilo was uh, taken up by the Supreme Court. So many people that kind of follow this were aware of it. And again, most people were opposed to the use of eminent domain for private development purposes. Uh, and so when the court ruled against the property owners in a very narrow five to four decision, people were just outraged by this. And they just could not believe the court had signed off on something like this. And in a case that, you know, not only was it kind of easy for people to understand, but they could relate to it in a way that a lot of other cases, people just don't, I mean, they might feel strongly about it, but it doesn't really impact them directly. Not so with Kilo. You, everybody could look at the homes that were uh, in that neighborhood and say, that looks just like my home or a home that I want to live in uh, uh, someday. And so it was of great concern to people. And so we were able to take this genuine outrage that existed in the country and turn it into meaningful change. And so as a result of, uh, of the backlash against Kilo that we uh, uh, stoked and, and ran with, uh, 44 states changed their law to better protect uh, property owners. Uh, dozens of these projects were defeated in the wake of, of Kilo because communities rose up in opposition uh, to them and are great activism team at, at, at IJ worked with folks to fight back against that. Uh, most state courts that have looked at this issue under their own state constitutions have gone in the opposite direction than what the Supreme Court did in uh, Kilo. Kilo, uh, the federal constitution provides a floor of protection for individuals, but states under their own state constitutions can um, recognize greater protection for the citizens of their state. And um, usually state Supreme Courts will follow what the Supreme Court does in many instances. I don't think that's a good idea. And they ought to interpret their own state constitutions uh, in a meaningful sort of way. But uh, that's the way most of them do it. The exact opposite happened in, in Kilo, where they ran away from that interpretation, said regardless of what the U.S. Supreme Court did, at least for the people in our state, we're going to protect them from these types of, of, of abuses. So it's something that really led to significant change throughout the country, even though it, you know, it, was, a, it was a wrongfully decided uh, a wrongly, wrongfully decided case by the Supreme Court. That, that sort of stuff makes me really optimistic. I don't know. I really, yeah. even though the Supreme Court didn't do anything, other states did, which is... So cool. Um, so finally, what is one thing you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? I think it goes in part to some of the work that I did, especially on the eminent domain front and um, and, and other issues that, that I litigated over 25 years at IJ before they taken over as, as president. You know, I, I used to think that most of the people in power were venal individuals, oftentimes corrupt, 
uh, megalomaniacs. <laughs> and even though that is certainly those characteristics can be true for several people that, that are in power, uh, after litigating these cases and you know being across from them and and deposing them in in um, in, in litigation, I, I kind of changed my perspective and saw that many people genuinely believe that what they were doing was for the benefit of the public. Uh, that this was a, a sincere belief on their part. The problem, though, and so that was a, this just a different perspective that I got on that. To kind of change, say that okay, that you know maybe these people, at least in their heart of hearts, have some have some good intent. But the problem, though, that I saw over and over again is that they were willing to take an ends justifies the mean means approach because they said, well, what I'm doing is so good, I am willing to set aside constitutional norms in order to um, in order to carry out that good. And that is where the danger really is. You know, our constitution does not have an ends justifies the means approach that, yes, the government could kind of promote economic development, but it should not be allowed to steal the homes and small businesses of people in order to try to accomplish that goal. Everybody recognizes that the government should stop um, criminals, but that doesn't mean the government can violate the protections in the Constitution against unreasonable searches and seizures and the myriad other ways that government says that the Constitution says, listen, these values are so important that, yes, in some ways it might hamstring what law enforcement is doing or economic development officials want to do, but these rights are so important that they have to be respected uh, as you further these greater public uh, uh, goals. And so that's why it's so important to have checks in place on the legislative and executive branches of government, why we should have courts that are engaged on these issues, and there should be advocates that are there to make sure that the rights guaranteed in the Constitution are given life in, in today's times. Yeah, I think that's a good response. I like that. I mean, it is really important to remember that the end doesn't justify the means. I mean, the end is important a lot of the time, but like you still have to abide by the Constitution the entire time regardless and respecting individual rights, property rights, all of that is should be at the forefront of whatever you're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. And, and it also shows, too, some of these old maximums, the end just, uh, doesn't justify the means that many classical liberals have, have written about for years um, are true. And it's also true, Lord Acton says, that power corrupts. And that's definitely true, that even people with the best of intentions, once they are in power, you have a tendency to abuse it. Uh, and that is why there has to be um, the ability of individuals to to check those abuses and to make sure that those in power are constrained by the limits that are in the Constitution and that people's rights are respected. Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight, and I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.